From the outside in, it may seem that writing any music for media is kind of all the same. You know, there's a composer who sits down, writes music to match whatever's on the screen and whatever comes to mind. But there are some key differences that separate production music from other careers like film music, game music, and even songwriting. So today, I want to discuss what really separates production music from other music for film, TV, games, and advertising. Plus, we're going to take a listen to a lilting and upbeat folk song arrangement featuring trombone written by a member of the 52 Q's community on this week's episode of the 52 Q's podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Cues Podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects of being a working production music composer. Plus, we feature a cue written by you, a member of the 52 Cues community, and this week we're going to be taking a listen to My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, written by Nathan Toft, which is a sing-song arrangement of the classic folk song and features him on trombone, so you definitely want to stick around for that. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm so glad you found me, however you found me. I know you have a ton of options out there, whether you're listening uh, via podcast or watching via YouTube, but I sincerely thank you for spending part of your day here with me. I also want to give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52Qs who help keep the podcast, the channel, and everything we do here going. We are 100% community supported, so you're not going to hear any ads for mattresses or meal plans. But if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52Qs and unlock perks like live streams, workshops, Zoom feedback sessions, and a ton more, then be sure to click on the links in the description or stick around because we're going to be talking much more about that a little bit later in today's episode. So I wanted to, to really clarify the difference between production music and, say, film music or game music or, or even, to a lesser degree, songwriting. But I think there's a lot of confusion that can happen, especially if you're watching a channel like this or another channel which might be more geared towards film music or geared towards game music or you're taking um you know you're watching tutorials on production and it's you know kind of all about songwriting and so we have to i believe we really have to keep in mind that we're writing production music so i want to unpack some of the key differences and one of the biggest key differences is with film scoring film music is different than production music. Now, a good editor will take production music from a catalog and it will sound very scored. I'll, I'll, I'll absolutely recognize that. The best editors will edit their cues together that they get from the catalog and it will sound like an underscore. It will bob and weave with the scene and will really support the, the narrative structure. But that's not how production music is necessarily created. So with film music, it is a scored gig, meaning that the, the composer is sitting down and writing music to match a scene. Most of the time there's video and they're, they're writing their music. And if this happens in the scene, then their music matches it. If, 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 if it's a chase scene that starts out with a lot of running and then stops, then the, the film composer will write one cue that will traverse those emotions, will lock into the action that they're seeing on, this, on the scene. Film, film cues have to uh, match what's happening on the scene, on the screen rather. Which means that sometimes the, the phrasing, the met metric shenanigans that happen, like time signatures and really weird decimal point-based tempos, those all are in play. But for production music, we, we don't do that. We write one emotion 
and we have two minutes of this one emotion. And so it's like giving an ingredient to an editor. Use this ingredient for when you need it in your scene. And we're not writing music that traverses, for the most part, that traverses a large emotional distance. You start off intrigue, you end intrigue. You start off positive and happy, you end positive and happy. And if an editor has a single scene that starts happy but ends melancholy, they're not going to look for one cue that does that, that makes that journey. They, they can't. They, they, don't, they don't have time for that. It would be really difficult to try to find that in the library that not only you know, matches the pacing and all of that, but emotionally communicates what the scene really, really needs. Now, that's not to say that all production music is completely one-dimensional. There are some production music tracks that have a bit of an emotional arc, but in general, we are writing one emotion. We're not writing a whole sequence of emotions that a film composer might write in a single scene. We're writing one emotion, and if the editor has a scene that, again, starts happy and ends melancholy, then they're going to find two cues. They're going to find one cue that is upbeat and positive, and then they'll go back into the library. They will search keywords, probably search similar instrumentation, maybe a complementary key if it goes to a minor key, similar tempo. If possible, you know, they might find a, the same composer. But they're editing, they're going to be stitching together multiple cues to say or to communicate the story beats that are happening. And this is a huge advantage because they can do it quickly. They could do it relatively inexpensively because it costs money to, to hire a film composer, right? That costs money and takes time. It takes production time that most, most production uh, for unscripted TV, those types of editors, they don't have. And it's why you will hear so much music in unscripted television. Because without a script, there is, there's no writer making sure that the dialogue you're seeing on the screen, that the character interactions are propelling the story forward. Instead, you have, you know, producers who kind of create situations, roll camera, but there's no script. The, the actors, the characters that you're seeing on screen, for the most part, are not reading lines that they've memorized. So without a script, without a writer, without somebody making sure that the, the, all the dialogue makes sense, all the dialogue is pushing the character development forward, adhering to you know the three-act structure or the, the, the hero's journey or whatever. Without those writers, the editors have to lean on the music to support those emotional undercurrents. Much more, much more so than in film music. This is why they need multiple emotional cues that have a single emotion so that they can stitch those together and create the underscore. And again, the best editors make it sound like underscore. The best ones do. So the primary difference between film music, and I'm including any, uh, any uh, scripted, scripted um, movie, scripted, even scripted TV, scripted documentaries, these types of things. They have a composer who is writing the music, creates a consistent narrative arc, and the music can be really odd. The phrasing can be really weird. 
The timing can be weird. The time signatures can be really strange. When you watch it to picture, it, it, it makes perfect sense. But as soon as you remove the picture, then some of the, some of the uh, musical choices seem a little suspect, which is why it can be a real challenge to, uh, to reference film music when you're studying structure and all that kind of thing. So that's, I think, the biggest difference between film music and production music. I mean, there are some other differences. With film music, the deadlines can, can be sometimes pretty brutal, and there are crunch times when the, you, you might be waiting on a, 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 a picture lock. You might be waiting for video so you can get started. I mean, you've probably worked up some themes and those types of things, but you're waiting and waiting and waiting, and then it's kind of like all systems go. And if they've announced you know, the release date, and then that, that date is just like a boulder, Indiana Jones-style rolling towards you. You have to keep moving or you're going to get crushed by it. So the deadlines can be pretty rough, and there are some 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 real real crunch times. I mean, crunch time happens in production music, but generally, when you're writing for a library, those 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 deadlines are more about releasing an album, not necessarily a release date for a film or a or a TV show. This uh this does happen a little bit with sports broadcasting because those those sports are uh, are coming at you and football season's going to happen whether I write a cue or not but um they the the, the deadline is more from the publisher and less from the client cuz the client has a whole library full of music to choose from. Also when you work on a film or a scripted television show, you'll probably get on-screen credits. In fact, credit, music by, is hugely important in the film music world. But in all of the placements I've had, I've only gotten one on-screen credit ever. Because if, if the production acknowledges the music at all, it's rarely ever a composer. It's usually, if, if it's acknowledged at all, that on-screen credit would be the, the production house, music by whatever. But it's not a person. Now, that's not to say that I don't add credits in my IMDb because my royalty statements come in, I check my cue sheets, and I'm like, oh, I got air on this episode or that episode. Then I'll go into IMDb and add additional music, composer, additional music. I'm not the composer because that meets that means something else. I'm not the composer. That Im- I think that implies, I feel like that implies scoring. Instead, it's composer colon additional music or additional music by. And then I'll add those credits to my IMDb. But for film music, that's one of the perks of being a film composer (laughs) is getting on-screen credits. And also because it's generally, you know, it's a one one person job, right? A a 42 minute episode of Thousand Pound Sisters or, you know, Louisiana Law. I mean, it might have 80, 90, 100 different cues in one hour long episode, which is 42 to 43 minutes. And so you couldn't possibly list all of those, nor is each composer going to work closely with the production team. But if you're doing a film score, it's like you, you're doing it, you're probably gonna be working really closely with the director and that can be really good because you can, you can get direct feedback and it's not kind of a lottery <laughs> of whether or not your music gets picked from a playlist. But it can also mean tons and tons of revisions, a lot of back and forth, a lot of last minute changes, the picture changes, and then suddenly you have two minutes of music, but you, the scene is now only a minute and 30 seconds, so you're having to edit. So yes, it's a lot of back and forth, but it's also a lot of back and forth. 
And that, that can be challenging, but it could also be rewarding. As someone who has pitched to libraries, who has gone the taxi route of, of kind of submitting and then getting feedback, and that feedback might just be silence, not hearing back anything at all, or the feedback is, you know, a return or a rejection. You know, that happens with taxi. You get a return and it might be just a small tweak that needs to be made, like a mixing tweak, but it's a, it's a return with no recourse, really. But I mean, that's, that's what taxi does and that's their business model. And it's kind of what you sign up for when, when you, um, when you submit. But when you're working on a film project or a scripted TV show, then you're working with a a director who will give you feedback and revisions are expected. True. I mean, to be fair, when you get in with a library and you're working on an album or something like that, then revisions are absolutely a thing. So I'm not saying that production music don't ever get into revisions but it seems that because you're scoring, that those revisions can feed into the crunch time that I talked about earlier. And uh, there's a, a single point of contact that seems to work a little bit more smoothly. Somewhat. Again, libraries absolutely give feedback. But editors, if you're submitting a, a cue for Dr. Pimple Popper, the editor isn't going to give me the composer mixing notes. It's not going to they're not going to give me phrase notes. Instead, they're just going to edit it or if it's not working, they're just going to move on to another cue in their library in the catalog. But I think beyond all of that, film music, and we're going to see the same with game music and songwriting, Film music is firmly artist territory. And I've talked about, you know, artist brain versus artisan brain. And, you know, I'll have a a link up to there where, where I talked about this isn't art. But film music really needs to be. I mean, it still needs to serve the story and support the emotional undercurrent and all of that. But I feel like film music elevates a little bit beyond what production music strives to be. Again, not disparaging production music. It's what what my entire career is predicated on. But just understanding, you know, I'm writing, you know, plucky dramedy cues, or I'm, you know, writing, you know, happy clappy ukulele cues or tension cues underneath, you know, a scene where somebody's going to learn if their cake won the contest. It's not necessarily art. But with film music, it it starts to get elevated into that territory. And originality, I think, is... I, I, I think there's a, a higher... How do I want to say this? Because I'm not implying that that production music is unoriginal, but I feel like production music is a lot more iterative than film music. I mean, when you when you dial up a, a new Hans Zimmer score or a new Mac Quayle score, you're, you expect each one to really have its own sound and each score to be unique with unique themes and all of that. Unique sound palette, but with production music, you don't, you don't, I don't think you necessarily expect that. I think film music puts a higher stock in originality than production music. Yeah, I think that's how I want to say that. A, a greater value, a greater emphasis. And I mean, I'd argue that I don't think all production music libraries are looking for completely genre expand not expanding but genre breaking originality 
because I don't think editors are necessarily looking to subvert viewers' expectations. If viewers are watching a dating show and you're wondering who she's going to pick, you could probably already start thinking about the type of music. But film music gets to gets to play a little bit more loosely in that sandbox. So that's how I feel film music is really different from production music. Now, some of these concepts are going to carry forth, especially the artist thing. But let's talk about game music. Game music is something that uh, I'm I'm actually dabbling in a in a game right now with a with a buddy of mine who is a developer out in Memphis. It's a little synthwave project, and so I'm doing two new things at once. I'm 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 wading into the shallow end of both game music and synthwave music. We'll we'll see how that goes, and I'll I'll let you know more <laughs> later. But with game music, uh, from a structural standpoint. And a compositional standpoint, your your music has to be considerably more modular, more loopable, because you've got to be able to layer your music so you have iterations of energy, which I think carries over very, very closely to what production music does, kind of gradations of energy without necessarily changing themes. So I think those are some carryovers. But... We don't necessarily give much, much thought to loopability and how, how our music can be dynamically interactive. And for game composers, that has to be like front and center because how the music is going to get used, how the music is going to get implemented needs to remain in the forefront of your mind as a game composer. No, that's not to say that you're not writing good themes and you're not, you know, doing, you know, the overall arc of of a, of a of a track or of a, of a cue, but you are always in the back of your mind thinking the the modular quality of the music. Whether it's stacking vertically, whether it's loopable, how can you transition from one, one portion of a cue to the, another portion of the cue or another cue altogether? How are those going to blend? What kind of connective pieces do you put in between those? My, one of my favorite examples of, of how game music is interactive and modular is the, um, you, like in Super Mario World, when you jump on Yoshi, right? Bongos show up. Little bongos. And the bongos are like like always in time and they always work and it's great. You jump off Yoshi, the bongos stop. That's the clearest example of of modular dynamic interactivity. And uh, one of the earlier examples that I remember like, oh, this is the game music reacting to what I am doing. And games obviously have only gotten more sophisticated since then. And so your music has to be more sophisticated and has to be able to work and bend with whatever the player is doing. There can be some linearity, but the linearity isn't a two or three minutes of linearity. It's more like two or three phrases of linearity. That's all stackable and loopable. The deliverables are much more intense in game music because all of those modular layers have to be delivered separately to a game developer so that they can lay them into their game and program them so that they react to whatever the player is doing dynamically. And so there is this nonlinear quality that has to be in your mind as you are writing game music. And you think the deadlines, and you think the deadlines for films are rough? Deadlines for games, the crunch, you've heard about it, can be intense. Can be intense because it takes a heavy lift to launch a game of any kind. 
of any kind, whether it's a little mobile puzzle game or whether it's a AAA game with voiceover and, and cutscenes and all of that. Very, very brutal deadlines. Also, um, tracking royalties can be really challenging with games because usually, and I feel like this is changing, especially with, with uh, digital downloads and games. I feel like this is changing and it's something I feel like they touched on at the Production Music Conference. But for the most part, and how it's been for a long time, is, is that the music is a buyout. You get a chunk of money up front and nothing else because our like ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, I don't think they're positioned to track royalties. And so any royalties you get would be directly through, through the game developer or the game publisher. And so they usually don't bother with that. So you're not going to get any back end. You might get some back end on the soundtrack. If you get licensed to, to publish the soundtrack, or if the publisher of the game or the developer publishes the soundtrack, puts it up on Spotify or whatever, then you would be owed copyright or uh, royalties then. But from actual game sales? No. The real question comes in, uh, what about streamers? Somebody's playing your game on YouTube or on Twitch. Your music is being heard you should be paid royalties for that, I believe. But right now the system isn't really set up, set up to do that. So much lower chance of backend. The system isn't currently set up to really track that. And so generally a buyout. What could be a real drag though is starting your career, you're going to be dealing with mostly indie developers who are going to have just a little bit of money, if any. And so there's no real like back end. And so at that point, you're really doing it for the experience and for the portfolio. That's why I'm doing this game, the Synthwave Q, the Synthwave game I'm working on for the experience and the portfolio. I've always wanted to break into games, just haven't found the right opportunity. And then finally, just like film music, this, this is pretty much artist territory meaning originality, meaning you don't want your music to be super iterative. I mean, obviously, if it's a, if it's a horror game, you're going to bring along all your horror tropes. If it's a puzzle game, you're going to bring up all of your, you know, your, your quirky bleep blorp kind of <laughs> tropes. I know with this synthwave game, and it's a puzzle game, but it's kind of set in like, it's got a, this retro 80s vibe to it. And so, hence synthwave. And I'm leaning into all of the synthwave tropes: the the gated reverb on the drums, right? The uh, Stranger Things kind of cascading sine wave pulses. All of those things. All of those things. Even picked up a couple of uh, libraries and sample packs that are that are '80s synthwave nostalgia, uh, vaporwave, whatever vaporwave, where vaporware. Vaporwave, I think that's the right term. And so it's been really fun exploring, exploring this territory because I know, I know very, very little about it. Uh, I, I like it. I've heard a lot of it, but I don't, I don't write it very often. And what I've actually, what's interesting about it is, is I've discovered that the, um, some of the tools I've been using for my Tension cues, namely like zebra patches, those actually work really well when you put them into the context of synthwave. Now, you put like Omnisphere drones and big epic cinematic toms, and it doesn't necessarily sound like synthwave, but you you surround them in like old school Moog type pulses and and 80s Lindrum sounds then uh, then it's actually, they, they work really well. And so I've been using a mixture of like synthwave presets, like for Omnisphere and Zebra presets, which just work because they're, they're unapologetically synthetic. And so the last thing I want to talk about 
is songwriting, because I'm sure there are folks out there who are songwriters. And I know that there is songwriting for sync, for libraries, but I'm really differentiating production music, instrumental production music, the type like tension cues for, for reality shows and that kind of thing, not necessarily writing a song for sync that's like going to get on an ad. But the biggest thing is the lyrics. The production music that we write doesn't have lyrics, which means the production music that we write doesn't necessarily like tell a lyrical story. And as soon as you bring lyrics to the table, not only does that dramatically impact your production time and your, you know, can you sing? Are you a good lyricist? How are you with rhymes? There's a whole other set of skills that has to be brought to the table that production music just doesn't require, which I'm I'm okay with because I'm not a singer, nor am I a lyricist. Funnily enough, I dabbled with it when I was in a band uh, after college, but, um, but I don't really do much of that now. But because there are lyrics and because you're looking to tell the story, then that, that means songwriters and songs generally have a much more involved form and structure, your typical kind of song form, your verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, outro. And the verse and the chorus are somewhat related, where the chorus feels like an expanded, you know, verse energy, but the bridge is usually goes off into another direction. Your B section or your C section goes off into a whole other direction, maybe even completely different chord progression, maybe even going to the parallel minor, because songs tend to tell a more complete story, lyrically, of course, but also musically. And so with production music, we're not necessarily looking to do that. We're not looking for our music to tell a complete story. Like I said, talking about film music, we're telling one scene of a story. Also with songwriters, you're, you're firmly, firmly in artist territory, probably the most in artist territory, which means you're probably also going to be looking for distribution channels outside of the distribution channels you would pursue in production music, namely Spotify, Apple Music, all those things. For a couple of reasons. First of all, I don't know how interesting it is for someone to, to dial up a happy, clappy ukulele cue and just listen to it recreationally. I don't necessarily have interest in that. I mean, I listen to my own music, but generally because I'm analyzing it and, and, and making sure, hey, how's this mix sound and all of that. But I, I don't ever like dial up production music just to listen to. If I've had a long day and draw up a, a bubble bath and a glass of champagne, I'm not, I'm not dialing up I mean, like epic trailer music. So I don't need to put my music necessarily on Spotify. Also, I can't for the most part because I don't hold the copyrights because my libraries do. But songwriters, mm, you probably do want to, even, even if they're sync songs, you probably do want to put them up into Spotify, into these streaming channels, because as an artist, you're really looking to support your own artist brand. You as an artist, as a songwriter, as a lyricist. So putting your music out on Spotify, Apple Music, will support the the footprint you have. So if you were to submit something up to sync, then a music supervisor or or an editor or a sync agent can look at your following and say, hey, this song has been streamed a hundred thousand times. People might know about it, so it can support our shoe commercial. This is something they talked about at the PMA conference. They had sync agents and, and they, they talked about the difference between like sync and libraries and everything and artist recognition and artist 
branding was part of it. So if you're a songwriter writing music for sync, writing songs that you intend to, to pitch to whether they're libraries or sync agents or advertising firms or whatever, your following absolutely matters, according to sync agents at the conference. And your following has a direct impact on how much you can ask for those sync licenses. If you have 100,000 followers on Spotify, you can ask for 10 grand for that placement. If you have 1,000 followers, maybe you only get three grand. Again, that's direct from them. Words from the sync agent, sync agent, words from the music supervisor. Production music composers, we don't really need to cultivate a following. Again, nobody wants to necessarily listen to glockenspiel music. And also, as production music composers, we're writing things all over the map. I'm writing a synthwave cue this week. I wrote a, a, a tension cue the week before, and I was playing didgeridoo the week before that. <laughs> so from an artist's standpoint, the lack of consistency can be really, can be kind of uh, frustrating for, for an audience who's trying to figure out who you are as an artist. But again, we're not artists. This isn't art. But if you're a songwriter looking to pitch for sync, get your music on, the me on media, then you have to develop that brand. All of those things that go into being a successful artist are in play, and they're not for production music composers. For the most part. I mean, there are some production music houses which kind of have elevated into artist territory, like in Spotify, I think of Bleeding Fingers. They're a production music company. They also do like custom scoring, but they're production music. Extreme Music is another one. Um, ES Posthumous, uh, Two Steps from Hell, you know, they do a ton of, a ton of like trailer stuff. They're, they put their stuff out on Spotify and get lots of listeners and lots of followers. But most of us, I mean, it's cool to have my music up there, but that's not my goal. Spotify and streaming services are not, are not a channel of promotion for me as a production music composer. They're just not. They're cool. And it's, and it's fun to have, and to be honest, feels good to see your music up on Spotify, but it's not a channel that I actively pursue. But songwriter, you better, because that's part of the modern landscape. So those are my thoughts. Um, the idea of how production music is different from film music, different from game music, and different from songwriting. But what do you think? Was there anything that I missed? Do you disagree with any of these. And if you are a film composer, a game composer, or a songwriter, I would love to hear from you. Please let me know in the comments below. I do read all those comments and make an effort to respond to those. But please, I would absolutely love to hear from you. All right, so we are going to take a quick break. And when we return, we are going to take a listen to My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, written by Nathan Toft, who's a trombone player, and he recorded live trombone on this arrangement of a classic folk song. Uh, but uh, we're going to listen to that right on the other side of this break. Hey, y'all. I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52 Cues podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52 Cues isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. The best part is that the 52 Cues community is absolutely free. And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. 
I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com. was my Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, an arrangement of a classic, I think a classic Scottish folk song uh, arranged by Nathan Toft. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to feature this this week is because I love the trombone playing. I absolutely love the trombone playing. And I know that you said over at 52 Qs, you mentioned you said the track was more of an exercise to record your trombone using a very modest basement setup. You used a, a CM25 Mark III condenser mic bundled with the Focusrite 2i2. And I gotta tell you, I think the trombone sounds absolutely magnificent. And really rock solid playing, rock solid pr playing. So if if you're in the 52Qs community and you need a trombone player, then look Nathan up. That's really rock solid, solid playing. I even like the piano parts. It's the drums that were really kind of not working for me. And uh, I think they're a little boom, boom, bat one, two. They're a little waltzy. And uh, I, I would want to hear boom. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. You know, so that kind of a vibe, I think that kind of a pulse and groove could work a little bit better. It's just, it felt a little bit too, too. And so I think, I think, a, a more kind of halftime groove could work better with the piano and everything that you have uh, going. I, uh, the, the sound of the piano is really nice and really, uh, I think, played, played pretty well. But yeah, considering how busy your piano part is, it's very, very accompaniment, you know, boom, boom, ba -dee -dee -dee, -da 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 -da, then your drums, I think, kind of playing slower behind that could really could really help out. And uh, I got to tell you I wasn't ready to leave. I would make the statement and then go ahead and make that statement again. Maybe this time make it with the piano and the trombone. We're only 20 seconds in. And if we're thinking, you know, cues, and, and, and I know that you didn't necessarily write this with, you know, production music in mind, but go ahead and restate the melody again, and then go to the bring back. Again, a really nice, really nice trombone playing. 
the intonation is spot on. And if you double up the the verse at the beginning, assuming uh, uh, assuming or in my mind the verse is my body lies over the ocean, and then bring back, bring back. That's the chorus. I don't know if you do the two verses and then the chorus. I don't know if you need this little interlude. I mean, it works. I do like like handing off to the piano. I think that works. Again, the drums are just kind of too busy because you're playing the, the, the ride symbol a little bit too much. And I wonder here, when the piano takes over the chorus, do some trombone, uh, some hull notes. You know, just just some 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 trombone accompaniment could be really nice through there. And then key change. Do a key change. Why not? Why not? I think that could be really, really effective and to kind of push all of the energy forward. Let's go to a five of five and into a new key. Whereas you kind of pulled the energy back here. I, th I think you could have done a verse chorus. So in, 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 in my mind, having this kind of be... Um, be verse, verse, chorus, right? And then, then maybe the interlude and then, uh, verse, chorus, key change, verse, chorus, big. That's kind of how I would do it. So this would be on the trombone. Uh, this would be piano. Oh, that's a piano. <laughs> uh, then add the bone, uh, whole notes and then, uh, maybe trombone and piano there at the end to where it's it's really big with the key change i think that could really work mm -hmm. and then then end it with a, a nice nice solid button yeah, something, something like that could absolutely work. Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for sending this along. I really, really did appreciate it. As I mentioned, this cue was submitted during our weekly feedback thread over at 52 Cues. And if, if this is something that uh, that you would be interested in, then why don't you head over to 52 Cues, join us. It's free to join and it's something that we do every single week and we'd love to see you. And you know what? If you found this feedback helpful and uh, maybe uh, you'd like personalized feedback, uh, video critiques, in-depth of your own cues where I break down things like form, structure, harmony, mix, and a lot more, then you can also head over to 52cues.com coaching. And while you're over there, you can check out some of my other coaching services like one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions, masterminds, and more where we work together towards your own career goals in production music. So again, I definitely want to give a huge shout out to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Qs who help keep the lights on here. But otherwise, that's going to do it for me today. You definitely want to tune in next week because I am interviewing the CEO and founder of Taxi, Michael Lasco. And we're going to talk about the things that we as production music composers need to do to make our publisher's job easy. So you definitely want to tune in for that, but that is going to do it for me. I hope that you had a stellar week 37, and I know that week 38 was also good. Why do I know that? Because I know and I believe that the universe has amazing plans for you. But that's going to do it for me. Until next time, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2022, Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Cues community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52cues.com.